At the foot of State Street in Hartford, Connecticut, is the ramp that passes over I-91 and connects to the Founders Bridge that crosses the Connecticut River. Just south of it is the elevated plaza that leads to Mortensen Riverfront Plaza. Before the bridge was built in 1957, though, this section of State Street east of Front Street looked very different. This is a view of the old east side of Hartford during the flood of 1936. The heart of this neighborhood, which was home to generations of immigrants until it was all demolished in the late 1950s to make way for redevelopment, was Front Street, which ran north and south parallel to the Connecticut River. Front Street intersected with State Street, which ran eastwards from Main Street and the Old State House to the Connecticut River. In this video, I'm going to talk about the lost buildings and businesses that used to exist on State Street east of the intersection with Front Street. For decades, this would have been the first part of Hartford encountered by visitors arriving by steamboat or on the old Valley Railroad. With the construction of the Bulkley Bridge, Connecticut Boulevard was also created as a thoroughfare, linking that bridge to the foot of State Street. Early on, the area was a center of Hartford's trade with the West Indies. It also became home to numerous warehouses of the Connecticut Valley's tobacco industry. Before we get started, if you enjoy this video, please consider hitting the like button. Also, I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel, which will help support more content like this video. This is a picture of the intersection of State Street and Front Street in 1906. The view is westward, looking toward the old post office building that used to stand next to the old State House. The picture on the left was taken from a little further east showing buildings on the south side of State Street. At the time of this photograph, changes were being made to the street grade of State Street in connection with the building of the Bulkley Bridge. The building on the southwest corner of State and Front is shown in both pictures. The building on the southeast corner, 205 to 207 State Street, was the home of a long-lived paper company. Begun in 1864 by E.J. Carroll, it was taken over in 1877 by Carroll's brother-in-law, Patrick Garvin. Born in Ireland in 1836, Garvin came to America in 1851 and eventually went into business as a contractor and builder in East Hartford. He erected many buildings east of the river in both East Hartford and Manchester, and there's a street named for him in East Hartford. After he took over his brother-in-law's company, he continued it under his own name and developed it into one of the leading retailers of paper products in the country. Patrick Garvin also owned several paper mills, and he entered politics as well representing East Hartford in the state legislature in the 1880s and being elected a state senator in 1890. Serving on Hartford's Board of Park Commissioners, he was instrumental in creating Riverside Park. After his death in 1912, the company P. Garvin Incorporated was led by his son, Thomas F. Garvin. Among their products was Nabob toilet paper. The building itself had to be rebuilt after a fire in 1887. Next door were other 19th century commercial buildings at 209 to 211 State Street and 213 to 217 State Street. For this next photo, we've turned to a view east down State Street towards the Connecticut River. The buildings I just mentioned are on the right. Next east of these was a somewhat grander building at 219 to 221 State Street. A previous building on the site, 
which seems to have been a tobacco warehouse, appears in a photograph of the area from 1868 or thereabouts. For many years, this building and the ones on either side of it were home to either grocery stores or tobacco warehouses, the latter eventually predominating. But by the early 1920s, a hotel occupied this building, which in 1926 became Gaylor Brothers Hotel. Alfred E. Gaylor left his job as an assistant buyer of rugs and carpets at Brown Thompson's to help his brother John in the new business. After John died in World War II, Adolph and his new partner, Harold Tolan, continued to run the hotel until it was finally torn down in 1957. The hotel was described by the Hartford Current as, quote, a home for stevedores and tobacco workers, drinkers and drifters, and various other unfortunate persons for 30 years, unquote. Gaylor later said he always tried to give his customers wholesome food and clean rooms, which in the 1920s were 25 cents a night, which eventually rose to 60 cents before the hotel finally closed. The transients who stayed there called it the Old Homestead. By the time it was demolished, the upper floors were lined with cardboard and wooden cubicles where the men slept. Inspecting the building for demolition, a lieutenant from the local fire marshal's office dismissively said, The bums will leave Hartford now. They've lost their palace. Adolf Gaylor himself expressed great sympathy, however, once saying, I never looked down on these boys. I figured they needed somebody to understand them and listen to them. Let's turn to the other side of the street, the north side. Part of this block was owned by the Williams and Carlton Company. Before we get to that, let's do a three-way turn from an earlier image. So this was a view west up State Street. Now we've turned to look north up Front Street. Williams and Carlton is on the right. And now we're going to turn again to look east down State Street from Front Street. There's a prominent sign for Garvin paper, which I mentioned earlier. In the early 20th century, the three buildings on the left had come to be owned by the Williams and Carlton Company. The company started here at the corner of State and Front Street in 1825 as a retail drugstore conducted by Dr. Isaac D. Bull. At that time, the east side was a very affluent neighborhood. The company went through various partnerships, eventually becoming Williams and Carlton and evolving into a wholesaler of grocery specialties. It was known for Williams flavoring extracts, which included root beer and vanilla. After just over a century of operating in the same location in Hartford, the company moved in the 1920s to a new facility on Connecticut Boulevard in East Hartford and then moved to Boston in the 1930s. Here's a picture of the former Williams and Carlton buildings during the flood of 1936, and here's a close-up on the corner of State and Front. On the ground floor on the Front Street side were the Good Fit Uniform Company, run by Samuel Rosenbaum, and the State Pharmacy owned by Frank Uriccio and Daniel J. Ricci. Here are those storefronts in the immediate aftermath of the flood. The flood was devastating, but these two businesses reopened three months later with refurbished stores and new stock. Returning to our elevated view of the flooding, the buildings I've just been talking about were just east of Front Street. East of those were the three buildings at 216, 218, and 220 State Street. By 1936, these had been enlarged from the three-story row that had existed here 30 years earlier. On the right is an even earlier photo from 1884 of the building at 216 State Street. Among the businesses here then were E. H. Betts, dealer in salt and fish, 
and Francis C. Sturdivant, who made chicken feed under the name Imperial Egg Food. When the image on the left was taken in 1908, the advertisement covering the third floor of the building had been removed. This is a view west up State Street, another one that was taken when work was being done to change the grade of the street. On the far right is the wholesale grocery business of Tulin, Toft, and Tulin, which moved into the building at 222, 224, and 226 State Street in 1905. The partners acquired the building from Patrick Garvin, who I mentioned earlier. He owned a lot of real estate in the area. The company was named for the partners Shia D. Tulin, Lazarus Toft, and Samuel S. Tulin. The senior partner, Shia D. Tulin, was a leader in Hartford's Jewish community. He was born in 1849 in Homsk, Poland, which is now in Belarus. He came to America in 1886 and was first a farmer in Colchester for 10 years before coming to Hartford at the age of 49 to be head of the grocery company. He was president until 1916 and died at the age of 90 in 1938. The upper floors of the building were used by another business as a tobacco warehouse, one of many in the vicinity. The previous tenant in the building had been Joseph G. Lane, a very popular Hartford personality. For years he ran a wholesale liquor business and had Mark Twain as one of his customers. Lane had greatly expanded the building from what it had been before. Going back in time, here's the Lane Tulin building on the left in 1906. On the right is a view from a flood in 1862. It shows the gable-fronted brownstone building that existed before Lane altered it. Next east were the two buildings at 228 and 230 State Street. Here they are as well in a view of the 1908 street work. The building at 228 State had a distinctive triple-arched entrance. The building at 230 State had a gable front. By 1899, Patrick Garvin, the builder and paper manufacturer who I mentioned earlier, owned these buildings. In 1915, Thomas Trant, a dealer in wholesale plumbing supplies, who had been renting 228 to 230 State Street, purchased the property from Garvin's heirs. In 1916, Trant's brother Morris became his partner, and the company became Thomas Trant and Brother. It would grow to have one of the largest stocks of heating and plumbing supplies in New England. The rest of the buildings to the east of 228 to 230 State Street were demolished in 1905 to make way for the curve that linked the new Connecticut Boulevard to State Street. This was all associated with the urban renewal that occurred during the building of the Bulkley Bridge. This is a picture of the buildings at the corner of State and Commerce Street that were sadly demolished to create that curve. In this aerial view of Hartford in the 1920s, the Trant Building was still there just west of the curve. And here's a picture of the Trant Building and the curve in the 1950s. With the construction of the Founders Bridge in 1957, Trant and Brother moved to a new building on Van Block Avenue that is now a storage facility for the Connecticut State Library. Across the street, on the south side of State Street, was the old Gaylor Hotel that I mentioned earlier. Just east of that were the remaining buildings on State Street that were demolished to make way for the ramps of the Founders Bridge. The buildings on the right were occupied by Lou Barron's Furniture Mart, which would soon move further west up State Street. The tall building in the middle of the block was erected in 1906 for a &S Hartman tobacco growers. The company was started by Adolf and Samuel Hartman, 
Jewish immigrants from Germany who settled in Manchester and opened a dry goods store in that town. After buying a tobacco crop from a farmer as payment of a debt, they got into the tobacco growing business. They became pioneers in growing the new hybrid known as shade tobacco. They bought land in the Buckland section of Manchester to start their growing operation, and in later years they bought additional land in the Connecticut Valley, including acreage in Windsor, Bloomfield, Enfield, and Suffield. The founding brothers died in the 1920s. Pictured in this advert are the next generation, Adolf's son-in-law, Albert Newfield, and Samuel's son, Morris. In 1928, they formed the Hartman Tobacco Company, a merger of A&S Hartman with two other companies, one of which was Stern Hartman & Company, established in 1906 by a group of partners that included Adolph's sons Gustav and Emanuel. The Connecticut shade tobacco industry boomed in the first half of the 20th century, and soon every building shown in this photograph and many others nearby were used as tobacco warehouses. For years, every September, thousands of men, women, and children would throng the area warehouses seeking employment for the tobacco sorting season. Let's talk about the remaining buildings from the Hartman Building to the Connecticut River. The photo on the left from 1908 shows the buildings that preceded the Hartman Warehouse. Next to that were the last two buildings on the block that existed before everything went down in 1957. But a half century earlier, there was a white painted building just to the east. On the right, is another photograph of that building, which was home to one of the east side's many saloons. And this view faces west, up State Street, with the white building on the left. For this next image, we've moved even further east, past the intersection with Commerce Street. The building on the left with the tower located at the southeast corner of State and Commerce was another saloon, Wilson's Cafe. Now we've turned to another view of that building, looking south down Commerce Street during the flood of 1909. The warehouse just west of the saloon was built in 1820 by David and Dudley Buck and used by the Buck Propeller line of steamboats until 1862. Now we have turned to a view eastwards, towards the railroad tracks and the Connecticut River beyond. The photo on the left shows the same area a few years before, just after Wilson's Saloon had been devastated by a fire in 1904. The business had a long history. Wilson had owned it for a decade at the time of the fire. But before that, it had been operated by George Washburn for 40 years as a restaurant famous for its shore dinners. Wilson would discontinue the restaurant, but continue the business as a saloon. After the fire, he replaced his burnt-out saloon with the Italianate-style building I already mentioned. A little further east, right next to the train tracks, was the old Valley Railroad Station. It was actually built long before the railroad came, however, in 1835 by Edwin Taylor, father of Samuel Taylor, who would take many photographs of Hartford. Edwin Taylor ran a grocery store here that catered to the steamship passengers who passed through here on their way between Hartford and New York. The roof of the building blew off during a high wind in 1837, and the discouraged Mr. Taylor decided to give up the grocery business and go into the lumber business instead. Years later, in about 1870, the building was sold to the Valley Railroad and used as its station until a new one was built in 1907. 
On the left is a section of the bird's eye view of Hartford of 1877, showing the Valley Railroad Station. Just to the north, across State Street, were several shack like buildings that also appear in the photograph on the left. This photograph was taken in the 1860s, before the railroad tracks were built. A building taken down for those tracks is pictured here. It was the old West India warehouse of Eliphalet and Roderick Terry. In the early 19th century, rum and molasses would arrive at their adjacent river dock. This building had been gone about a decade when the 1877 bird's eye view was created. Just east of the railroad tracks was the steamboat dock on the Connecticut River. Imagine a time when steamboats regularly came here. Here's a view southwards along the train tracks with the dock on the left. And here's a slightly later postcard. By this time, the new station of the Valley Branch of the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad had been built. This photograph is a view westwards from the river, with the new station on the right. The silhouette of the old station, by then torn down, is visible on the left. And in the distance is that building at the corner of State Street that I talked about before, long the home of Thomas Trant and brother. It, like everything else, would eventually be torn down by 1957. Here's an elevated view of the area I've been talking about, taken in about 1958, when all the buildings were gone. The Founders Bridge had been built and construction of the new highway was underway. Long gone were the days of trains and steamboats, of West India rum and Connecticut shade tobacco, of sellers of liquor and plumbing supplies, and of manufacturers of paper and vanilla extract. Constitution Plaza and the Phoenix Building would soon rise just to the west, and the area east of Front Street and north of State Street would become the home of 1980s office buildings. I'm going to end this video with a series of before and after images. Thanks for watching.